Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it is now it is uh, 2 p.m. GMT. We can start, I think. Please, Swati. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, is it okay? Yeah. Uh, welcome to lecture number five of Chris Freeman Sanitary Lecture Series, uh, Innovation Systems 101. And, uh, oops. It's, 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 uh, it's not moving further. I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm so sorry for, for this thing. Um, I'm Swati Mehta, and I'm pleased to be the moderator for this lecture. The title of uh, today's lecture is The Evolutionary Core of National System of Innovation, to be chaired by Professor Rasigan Maharaj and Rebecca Henlin. And the speaker is Lillian Kidula Lihasi. Oops. Uh, brief um, uh, introduction about the series. The series is in honor of Christopher Freeman, the founding father of modern innovation studies. Uh, 2021 is his birth centenary year and he was born on the 11th of September, 1921. Uh, this series is organized by a few alumni of PhD academies of the Global Network for the Economics of Learning, Innovation and Competence Building Systems, Global X, founded by Professor Lundwall. Uh, this series is co-hosted by UNU Merit, Netherlands. Uh, in all, in the series 101, we have 13 lectures, 38 speakers, and this spans three months up to 1st of April. And uh, the lectures in this series is by uh, early career researchers in innovation systems and are discussed by senior scholars. The objective of this series is to attract young blood into the innovation systems and embolden the early career researchers and interdisciplinaries to use the innovation system uh, in their research. So this is the core team of uh, 38 people. And uh, today we are having lecture number five and it's a great honor for all of us to have with us Professor Rasigan Maharaj and uh, Professor Rebikan um, uh, to chair this lecture, who are well known to almost all of us in this gathering. Professor Rasigan Maharaj is Nodal Head, Department of Science and Technology and National Research Foundation's Center for Excellence in Sinometric and Science, Technology and Innovation Policy, South Africa. He is founding chair director of the Institute for Economic Research on Innovation at Aswani University of Technology. He is Professor Extraordinary at the Center for Research on Evaluation, uh, Science and Technology of Stenbock University. About Rebecca Hennen, she is Innovation and Development Specialist for Africa Lakes. She is a visiting fellow at the Development Policy and Practice Unit at the Open University and at the Innovation Knowledge and Development Group at Elbock University, Denmark. She holds PhD from the University of Edinburgh, 
in the area of science and technology studies. She leads at work on rural electrification in Kenya. It's a pleasure to have you both uh, for uh, here. And uh, now I proudly welcome and introduce our sole presenter for today's lecture, Dr. Lillian Kedula Lihasi. She is an agribusiness and development practitioner, a consultant at the LEAD Custodium, and she served for over 20 years in various leadership capacities in research and regulatory institutions in Kenya. She holds PhD in agriculture and rural innovation from Egerton University, Kenya, and she is founder and team leader of the Yuande International. Um, uh, some mandatory announcement. The entire meeting is being recorded for academic purpose. The Zoom platform is provided by the United Nations University, Nashbridge Economic and Social Research Institute on Innovation and Technology. We are also streaming live on YouTube and uh, with this, I head over the floor to the chairs, uh, Professor Risikin and Becky, over to you, Risikin. Thank you very much, uh, Swati. Uh, uh, and uh, thanks very much, Radesh, and the organizers of the event. Um, uh, we've structured ourselves as well in such a way to afford to our good colleague, Lillian, the opportunity to, to make our presentation in full quite soon. So the way we've organized ourselves between Rebecca and myself is I'll make some introductory comments now, setting some context, and that'll provide the envelope within which uh, Dr. Lillian's uh, presentation is going to be made. Uh, following uh, Dr. Lillian's presentation, uh, um, Rebecca will uh, respond with uh, uh, some reflections on the presentation. And uh, I, I will also add some comments to that before we open the floor for discussion itself. So if that's all right with everyone, uh, I think we, we want to get into it. It's Friday afternoon. And, uh, you know, uh, if that's all right, uh, then we can move ahead, yeah? So I think uh, uh, we are meeting at a very interesting time and I'm seeing a lot of friendly faces pop up on the screen above me. And I must tell you, it's a huge, heartfelt, uh, uh, a nice feeling to see people's faces. Why? Because we're stuck in a very strange circumstance at the moment. Ourselves, as a species being, is being attacked by another life form. It's not another species to us. It's another life form. The virus may not have the intent that we sometimes give to it but its effect on us is devastating. And especially for us in Africa, this is not a threat that's trivial in any way. And it's especially because of the existential threat that we are faced, that the topic that's being discussed today is of such importance. And I really want to emphasize this. While all of us are trying to be physically distant from each other to reduce the vector transmission of COVID-19. We must not forget our social self because we are because of others. Yes. And in our ways of engaging, we need to draw down on the learning and bring the learning closer to us. So it's absolutely critical that in this lecture five, we are recognizing pioneers in the literature that have advanced how important learning is for how we organize ourselves. But we are only capable, and I, I use the word deliberately, we are only capable of making that translation from what we've learned into what we are doing if we have sufficient courage in confronting that which is opposed to us changing and transforming. So this remains a critical point today. Our world is very uneven and development is not distributed such that all of us have available capacity, capability and competences. And this stretches across all of the industrial sectors that we speak about. 
our world is also distributed very unevenly across the continents. All of us originate from the continent that Rebecca, Lillian, and myself are from, or where we are at the moment. But that unevenness has become perverse in terms of where we are at this point. 1.2 billion people do not have the productive capability to produce the vaccines that we require under these circumstances. And I do hope as we engage in the materials that Lillian so kindly has put together and is going to share with us, that we try to draw down lessons from that. So to that extent, some of the key points that I want to raise have been raised previously, and they've been raised by the colleagues that we are going to be speaking about as well. Two points stand out, and that's about history and context. We all know, but sometimes we treat it a bit glibly, that history matters. Yeah? Sometimes history matters when we are able to show it in a nice stylized diagram, nice periodization where each year leads to the one following and there's a sequence that we can see across time. As we put together that stylized representation, I hope that we are all encouraged to take a view that that simplicity, the elegance by which that can be represented excludes the huge amount of conflict that has led to the achievement of that stylized research finding. And by this, I mean, we have to understand how ideas have arisen in the time in which they were developed and look at its importance and relevance in terms of where we are today. And so in that context, learning and innovation and the relationship between learning and innovation is what's allowed us to reach as a species being uh, more than seven and a half billion of us occupying this planet today. We've all benefited from learning and translating that learning into better ways of organizing ourselves. In the last 300 years specifically, and with the advent and incorporation of all of the world into world systems, of a particular type, a very predominant mainstream view of how the economy operates has also vested itself. And here we have pioneers amongst us in the Globelix family that have challenged the orthodoxy of the mainstream and their frameworks that have come to dominate thinking globally. Yeah. I saw pop up on the screen just now, Dick Nelson. And it's from that long range of critical work done in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, that brings us to the literatures that we all now embrace. But a point that I think is important, especially for the uh, emergent scholars, as uh, Swati has placed an emphasis upon, is recognizing that while today we read it in published text, even achieving the publication at the time in which the work was being done was against a huge amount of resistance. And that resistance has not eroded colleagues. So by this, what am I saying? The mainstream still exists. It remains neoclassical, and it is fundamentally opposed to some of what this community is generating from the research work that we do. It is not possible for that compromise to bring these insights in and to fit into the equilibria that most of mainstream store uh, uh, places on a pedestal. In fact, today, the idea of discontinuous change or the type of uh, ruptures that are required for us are contested by a neoliberal form that wants us to return to something from the past. This is something we also be, uh, need to be extremely cautious about. The past that we have come from is not a good past. The future that we could possibly aspire to should be informed by especially the work that was done. And I think our good colleague Lillian is going to take us through some of that. How is it that we learn from actual practices around us 
and draw down from that lessons that can help us improve the way in which we do things. I also want to make a very specific note. As we remember our roots in the literature, we must also pay particular attention to nourishing the spirit of critical inquiry. If there's something that draws together the names like Dick Nelson, Luke Soot, Bengtoke Lundfall, Chris Freeman, and all of the colleagues, we must remember these colleagues didn't also operate in isolation. They also worked socially and embedded and generated networks across the planet that helped bridge the global north, global south divide. Our object, I hope, in the work that we are doing is not norming towards the inequitous systems that predominate in the global north, but rather that we look forward to a better world that affords us even the possibility of living. Under these circumstances and where we are, we have a huge amount to continue to learn. And I'm, I'm so happy to use those words uh, as a sequel uh, to our good colleague, Lillian, who's just, I think, uh, maybe a few kilometers to the north of me physically at the moment. Uh, and that's a very much an East African, pres East and Southern African presentation today. <laughs> and uh, I wish you well, Lillian. I've seen the slides and we've got a lot to share and I'm sure all the colleagues are really going to appreciate what you present. So can I pass to you? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. It's a pleasure. I'm pleased to be the sole speaker of today's presentation. I would say this is also an evolution. Maybe that's why we are talking about the evolutionary core. Over the series, we have been having two presenters with one chair. Coincidentally, today we have two chairs with one speaker, which is also an evolution maybe of the series. And we are looking forward to what we have at this series. Let me just share the slides. Okay, you are welcome to today's presentation. As the chair has said, we are talking about the evolutionary core of the national innovation system. He clearly stated that history matters. And as you'll see through this presentation, we are looking at the history of the evolutionary core. And the chair, Dr. Halim, will be able to complement this presentation by sharing on the, on the application or how this concept has been utilized specifically in Africa. Just as the chair said, it is more of Africa today and we'll be looking at the history. Then after that, the other chair will be able to look at how it has been utilized and she'll be specifically looking at the policy in the context of Africa. So this presentation will have the overview this is the overview of my presentation, where I'll be looking at the overview of the national systems of innovation. Then we'll look at the concept, the analytical framework, and then we'll go down to the learning economy. As the chair said, it's through interaction and learning that we have reached this level that we are. Through interacting with one another, social is important. As he said, even during this COVID season, it's important that we realize that we need one another. So as we look at the overview of the national systems of innovation, we realize that the system of innovation concept came into being in the early 1970s. Generally, as he says, literature varies. We realize that most of the, the term came into context, mainly due to the interaction between Christopher and Landwehr, Lundberg. When they were working together, they developed this system of national system of innovation. Generally, you find that Freeman is credited for being the one who introduced the concept through the unpolished report. But you find that Freeman credits Landval for this uh, introduction. But as Landval had said in his opening remarks during the first inaugural presentation, he said they had worked together for a long time and they were friends. 
So I think each of them credits one another for the work that has been done. We find that Landwell points out at the idea of national systems of innovation, which goes back to Lee's conception. We find that this system, uh, Freeman research drew heavily on the political economy of Lee's, and we find that the historical account of the, he was talking about the historical account on the rise of Japan as an economic superpower. When he was applying the Schum Schumterian perspective, you find that Freeman saw economic growth as resulting from innovation and diffusion of technology. However, in contrast to Schumpeter, Freeman was interested in the abilities of different nations to exploit this process to their own benefit. And they also wanted to look at what policy can do or can contribute in this respect. And you'll find that Dr. Harling will be addressing how this policy has been utilized in Africa. These abilities Freeman post, uh, pointed out varied a lot and they needed to be explained. He used the national system of innovation. He used the term, the factors within each nation could be used to explain the differences. Landwell's work explored the important social interactions between suppliers and customers and their role in encouraging innovation. We we'll go further and look at what they did, and we find that interest in this study has continued to increase since in the 1980s. And this was popularized mainly by Giovanni Dossi in a book that he edited. In this book, we find that Richard, Christopher, and Landval were able to discuss in four different chapters about the national systems of innovation. Landwell's work on interactive learning and Freeman on Japan's closing the technological gap provided a ground for the book to be edited and popularized. We find that in this chapter, Nelson concentrated on institutions equipping technical change in the US. Freeman once more focused on the Japanese case. The chapters of by Nelson and Freeman simply assume that, they are that they, there were national systems of innovation. But Landwell presents a theory as to why this might be the case. Therefore, we find that further research has been inspired by Freeman, Nelson, and Landwell. And you find now more researchers are coming up to do research in the systems of innovation, just as the chair had presented. We are looking at the analytical framework of the national systems of innovation. At the core of the thinking of this, we find that behind every analytical core, there was the system of evolutionary theory and institutional theory. We heard a lot about the institutional theory, which was shared by our colleague during last week's uh, session. And today we'll continue looking at the evolutionary theory. We find that this has been growing interest in the ideas of evolutionary ideas to the extent that new professional associations and journals have been developed. We find that even now we have the Journal for Evolutionary Economics that has come up due to the interest on evolutionary economics. The term was first coined by an American sociologist who is also an economist, Velvet. And we find that most economists before then believed that differences in development levels across countries were to be explained by differences in the amount of accumulated capital per worker. But after introduction of this, we find that this has focused more on technology as the driving force to growth and development. And this has been received and is receiving increasing support. With this support, we, have, we find currently that Many are adopting this, and this view has been consistent to the perspective of growth and development, which was made by Joseph Schumpeter, who was called as, who is referred to as the founder of the evolutionary economics. In understanding the evolutionary economics, we realize that the, this is the theory 
that proposes that economic processes evolve and economic, economic behavior is determined by both individuals and societies as a whole. Just as the chair had indicated, social, social capital is very key. And that's why we need individuals and societies working together as a whole in an interactive situation to start or in, uh, inspire innovation. You find that different generations of economists have continued to, to, to ensure that we understand the modern innovation system. And as the chair said, he's impressed by the new scientists that are coming up and studies that are being done that we'll be able to understand that there's need for evolutionary change. The foundations of evolutionary models were laid down in the seminal work of Nelson and Rinter. And we find that as they did this research, he indicated that at times to look at it, it would have been long even to register. But you find Nelson and Rinter try to create a realistic micro foundation for both growth theory and industrial dynamics. This led to initial models with humanitarian firms competing in a single market by means of the innovation and in, in, in imitative results. So we talk about Im innovation and we also have the imitation where countries after they innovate or firms innovate and they are those who come to Im imitate and as they imitate we continue to adjust to what has been and you find there is change. Researchers have now become more confident in the functioning of their simplistic models. And we find that there's been increasing study on coevolution of technology and institutions as a way of growth. We find that evolutionary economics is the main part of the economic, is part of the mainstream economics, and it's inspired by evolutionary economists. It looks at the, econ the economy as an evolutionary system, but it says that it's constantly changing and tending towards equilibrium. When you're looking at evolutionary economy, people are focusing on change and we are not looking at the non-equilibrium processes. We are not looking at equilibrium, but we are looking at the change processes that they are taking place day after that. One of the aim of the evolutionary theories is to help us understand and to predict the qualitative change because you're focusing on change rather than on the system being stagnant. As the chair had indicated, we are in a process of change in Africa, in the globe. We have seen the changes that have happened. And many times I look back and look at last year at such a moment. If somebody had told us about the change that is there now, about us having evolved from using, living what we were, to being in isolation, to keeping social distance, and even wearing masks, it would have looked like a dream. But now we are looking at history, as he said, and we can learn. The world is evolving, and it's time for us as researchers to be able to arise and see what are we able to do. He has talked about the vaccines and what countries can have done. We have other innovative ideas that we can bring up. But as we are saying, the world is changing, and there's need for us to be able to change, to adapt to the systems, and be able to innovate, to be able to bring change in the in the economic world. Like mainstream economics, we find that the evolutionary economics stresses on multidisciplinary uh, independence, it talks of competition, it talks of growth and structural change and resource constraint. So at the moment, we are not focusing on the contemporary where we are stuck at what we are, but we are changing as the system changes. And as we interact, as we learn, we are able to innovate and to be able to bring differences. Do you find that this, Evolutionary economics, just like the mainstream economics, it has the same, it, ha it has different institutions. But now you find that the approaches which are used to analyze this phenomena will vary from one to the other. If literature says that most consequential differences in scientific approaches usually occur at three levels of scientific reasoning. And therefore, we have the three levels as the ontological level. This mainly talks at the basic assumptions that are made about the structure of reality. As we are thinking about the approaches that we are developing, our reasoning will be looking at the ontological. What are the assumptions that are being made? 
about reality as I develop this theory. We'll also be looking at what are the problems that are being framed to induce the hypothesis and what are the methods that are used to express the various theories. Therefore, to better understand the evolutionary economics, it is key that we distinguish between these three levels of corresponding, often only the term in implicit assumption. We have talked about the heuristic strategy. We are looking at the ontological stance. And under this, we are looking at the dualistic and we also have the monolistic. Each of these scientists or researchers, you find that they had a different way of thought concerning what they were able to develop. In the ontological stance, what basic assumptions are made about the structure of re reality? And within, when you're looking at the assumption, we'll be able to look at it either they had monistic assumptions. In this case, they indicated that variety existing things can be explained in terms of a single reality, where you find that as you think about the theory that you are going to develop, the monistic uh, researchers or economists will be looking at the one, will be looking at explaining this as a single reality. While on the other side, we'll find that the idealistic ones will have priorities and they look at the notions of individual self-determination and sovereignty at the state level. So under the monistic, we had the universal Darwin system, which is inspired by genetic and it conceives economic evolution as directed change, which emerges from the formation, selection, cons conservation, and new routines. I know many of us have heard about the Darwin theories that were there for evolution. That is the main one we have had for over the years. And we have the universal Darwinism theory. It's mainly for understanding the complex population systems. And we find that populations are heter heterogeneous entities which evolve in interacting among themselves and the environment. And this what shapes the system. And as the chair indicated in his presentation, interaction is key. Therefore, as we are keeping social distance, let us know that we need one another. And it's through this interaction that innovation comes up. We also have the naturalistic approaches. This one we find that mainly Veblen, Reagan, Hayek, Nuik, and North contributed to this. Within the naturalistic concept, we find that evolutionary economists assume that biological heredity of humans has a lasting impact on their current behavior and that it limits economic evolution. Therefore, according to court, Thornton, Thornton or Veblen theory, institution change belongs to the sub-school, while belongs to this sub-school of naturalistic system. And we are talking about the kind of institution change, which is also discussed by Frederick and is also discussed by Douglas North. We also have the Schumpeterian system of, of theory concept, where we find that we'll discuss more about Schumpeter in the, in the study as we continue on. We have the neo Schumpeterian study also that has to be discussed. And in the process, we'll be looking at each of these so that we'll be able to understand how this system has worked. Recent evolution theorizing on economic growth and technology change was born out of growing dissatisfaction. According to Landvall, you find that he thinks that many of these neoclassical approach, the, many of this was because of the dissatisfaction or the delusionment that they had on the orthodox of the neoclassical approach. And we find that key criticisms have been labeled against the theory of neo neoclassical. And the main thing they are talking about, it is, is, is stylish and abstract assumption. And because of this, you find that they treat economic growth as something of a smooth process which involves a continuous tendency to return to equilibrium state. The evolutionary economists are thinking of us moving forward. There is process of change. We are looking at changing systems of innovation, changing systems in life rather than the equilibrium state. 
And this is one of the things that made them dissatisfied with the neoclassical approach. It also talks about the neoclassical growth models, the technolo technological is assumed to be exogenous and given thereby neglecting the very true or the very force that underpins observative, rea observable reality or even economic growth. Therefore, the evolutionary economies focusing on change that is happening, they decided that they have to progress and they propose that economic process are determined both by individuals and society. They shun the role of, you know, they shun rational choice theory of traditional economics, and they are looking at a field which will seek to explain the behavior, progress, and relation to evolution and evolutionary human instincts. We find that most of them agree that technological advance has positive impact on economic development, despite the different evolutionary economists that we have. We have those that are thinking of the new and the old, but one thing that they agree that technological advance has positive impact on economic development. This view, as we look at it, it will exemplify the Schumpeterian perspective of economic growth and technology progress. So as we progress, we are going to look at how this technology and, uh, and the economic growth perfects the national systems of innovation, of innovation. Therefore, we are looking at the evolutionary perspective of technological development. One thing that it has, it has been summarized into four, where we are looking at innovation, the technical and commercial outcomes that come out of this, many times you find that they are uncertain and these have characterized the innovative efforts. Therefore, here we look at firms being very prime focus in innovation within the national system of innovation. Therefore, as we are talking as an, about the national system of innovation, we should look at the firms that are in there and how these interact and leverage on each other to ensure that there is innovative activity and continue to profit each other. It also talks about the technologies that is embodied. And we find that we have a, degree, a certain degree of tacit knowledge that, local and, that is local and cumulative. And when you're looking at tacit knowledge, many times you find that it shall, be very, it shall be local and it will be reflecting that particular area. And evolutionary economies continue to think about innovations typically as results from research and learning. As the chair had indicated, it's because of learning and interaction that we have been able to learn and we are acquiring knowledge from the researchers that had been there before us. And as we continue to interact with one another, we are learning and we find that the dimension of technological development now features prominently when it comes to national innovation systems literature. We also realize that the, another perspective that the evolutionary economists have is that technologies develop along a relatively ordered trajectories within boundaries of the organization and technological paradigms. According to, uh, to Dossi, the technological paradigms will be referring to a collective frame that determines research and development practice and the pattern of technological development on the basis of the dominant design of that interface. Within this evolutionary economies, we have certain researchers that have contributed more to this. As we had indicated about Webler, Webler, he's the one who coined the issue of evolutionary economics. And he's believed to be, he believed that psychological factors presented are better explained with economic behavior than traditional rational choice theory. This one he used the example of social hierarchy and status to make his point, noting that demand for some goods tend to increase when price is high. He called it the conspicuous consumption theory. Veblen also drew upon many fields of studies, including the uh, anthropology, psychology, and Darwinian principles, where we find that Schumpeter many times was against the use of referring to biological theories when it comes to economy. So we find that Veblen and Schumpeter, 
Though the key people in evolutionary economics, both of them had two different directions of evolutionary economics. Veblen was anti-neoclassical, Schumpeter was pro-neoclassical. But all in all, they worked together to ensure that this was progressing. Schumpeter pioneered the theory of economic development and many times will be referred to as the founding father of evolutionary approach. We find that mainly he viewed technological development as a discontinuous change and this disequilibrium resulting from innovation and identified several sources of innovation, including the introduction of new products and new production methods. He also looked at the creation of new markets, the discovery of new supply sources and the reorganization of industry. He considered, he's considered to be the founding father of evolutionary economics. And despite his reservations of applying the principle of evolutionary biology, he interacted with the other evolutionary uh, economists to ensure that there's evolution. He introduced the notion of creative destruction, noting that following technological change, certain rents available to, are available to entrepreneurs. His model of creative destruction described the essential nature of capitalism as a relentless drive towards progress and expanding on Veblen's early observation. Despite their differences, he, they also worked together to ensure that he expanded this and to build on the evolutionary economic theory. His main argument was that human entrepreneurs are the main drivers of economic development and markets are just cyclic, moving up and down. And as companies consistently compete, they find solutions that benefit market. And as they compete, innovation comes, innovation is created and there is change. He was particularly hostile concerning the issues of Daoism we had talked about Daoism, and he was so fed up that at one time he decided just to forget about evolution, but he had to change his mind. He wished to analyze capitalist development as an evolutionary process and based on a perspective that was firmly rooted in economics and social sciences and not in biology. Generally, he felt that changes in social sphere are clearly much faster, more accumulative, and more conscious character than in biology. And therefore it required a different framework. So he did not understand why biology should be foundation when it comes to economic evolutionary economics. Chumbita attached importance to radical innovations as ingredients of economic development. He defined economic development as the carrying out of new combinations of products means by entrepreneurs. For him, these new combinations of products, new markets, new sources, and all the new, they give to products, they give forth new products, which are quantitatively different from those that preceded it. So he, he was more focused on novelty than looking at the static situation. We find that despite being among the first who lay, the, who lay out the clear concept of innovation, his views of the topic changed over time. I think he was just evolutionary and he kept on changing. His views kept on changing. As he was talking about evolutionary change, his view also about innovation continued changing. I can say he's a person who was action oriented. The way he thinks is the way he also, he was. He described development as a historical process of structure, structural changes, substantially driven by innovation, which was divided into new products. He also talked of new materials, new markets, new sources, and new industry structure. His common theme was the role of innovations or combinations and entrepreneurship in economic. During the 1980s, he inspired, he was inspired by the perspective of a lot of new work across the country, differences level and developed and growth performance emerged. Therefore, we find that 
Authors that emphasize on the crucial role of technology for development tend to talk about, to stress on catching up in technology. It's not by, it's not a free ride. There is need for technological change. There is need to innovate. There is need to interrupt. There's need to think in a new way. And you find that countries that are able to innovate, they are able to remain sustainable. We find that Shumpita is lumped together with Max. Literature says he learned a lot from him while he was in Vienna. He, he's criticized for underestimating the creation, the theory of creation and variety. And we find that he, uh, 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 though Vagaba argues that it is certainly not correct that he overlooked the rule role of continuing novelty in economic evolution. You find that Schumpeter took from Musk. He also learned from the historical school and from the neoclassicals. Being from neoclassical, he was able to learn from them and was able to build his theory learning from the others. Schumpeter also took from Musk the idea of capitalism that is driven by technological competition between firms. He suggested that the main way for capitalist firms to keep competitive was to increase productivity by introducing new and more efficient machinery. Generally, he summarized that firms that succeeded in introducing new and more efficient technology would see their competitive position improved. Those firms that were failed to, to innovate, they were unprofitable and you find that they were eventually driven out of market. He adopted the mass argument and you find that he used this as the centerpiece for, its, for his exposition of the evolution, evolutionary dynamics. Many times we, prefer, we refer to him as a Marxism because his argument he, he, because he extended the argument of Marxism by introducing broader notion and clear concept of innovation. While Marx limited the analysis of mechanization, you find that Schumpeter went beyond that. He looked beyond the mechanization and he focused on other elements as we have talked of new products, new methods, new issues. He was more of novelty. And we find that his Marxism approach we find that according to Marx and Schumpeter, the economic reward was successful. Innovation is transitory by nature. So innovation is stagnant, is not stagnant. There is the transition. We are transiting from one place to the other. We are transiting from one idea. We are transiting from new products to the other. And as he as earlier indicated, you find that you are finding that these products, when they are used, they are bringing in new products that are different or they are different form to what has been. Schumpeter, for Schumpeter, interaction between innovation and imitation was also, also has an effect on growth. And you find that if I could quote him, he says, the swarming of imitators that follows the introduction of successful big innovation implies that the growth of the sector or industry in which the innovation occurs for a while will be quite high. In addition, there may be derived effects in the same related fields because one, important innovation tends to facilitate or induce other innovation. So innovation itself also is transitory. It is not stagnant. One innovation through mutation will be able to introduce another innovation. And thus we find that evolutionary economics are talking about the change and firms that are innovating one after the other. When you're looking at the evolutionary aspect of the national system of innovation, we realize that Lanvel in his study said that the national system of innovation is an evolutionary concept due to the strategic role it gives to knowledge. And it can be defined in evolutionary terms because it is creating diversity it reproduces routines and selects farms, products, and routines. 
the analysis of innovation system may be seen as analysis of knowledge that is evolving through processes of learning and innovation. It is through learning innovation, interaction, firms interact, learn from one another, and they're able to innovate. And as innovate, there is also the imitation. You find that the innovator may be able to be recognized, but the imitator comes in and is able to imitate and come up with new innovation. So you find that one innovation is building onto the other. Landville came up with the assumptions that form the cause the core of the national system concept. And this I'll just quote, as he indicated, the, four, the assumptions are seven. And one of these is the elements of knowledge are important for economic performance. They are localized and cannot easily be moved from one place to another. This is one aspect that had also been identified by Shupita, where you find that the performance or economic performance are localized and cannot be moved from one place to another. Then you find that important elements of knowledge are embodied in the minds and bodies of agents, in routines of firms, in relationships between people and organization. So here we'll be talking about the tacit knowledge, which is embedded within the people and within the minds of the people. Another assumption was that learning and innovation is best understood and under outcome of interaction. Perhaps the most basic characteristic of, the characteristic of innovation system approach is that it's interact interactionist. Generally, you find that innovation comes through interaction. And as farms interact, as human interact, innovation appears. Through in interaction and learning, innovation comes. Interactive learning is a socially embedded process and that therefore, a purely economic analysis is sufficient. Since it is an interactive learning situation, we need to socialize, we need to come together, we need to interact. And as we build our social capital, interactive learning takes place. And as interaction and learning goes on, it starts out the development of innovative ideas, which are able to bring change. Learning and innovation are strongly interconnected. So we cannot say that learning is on its own. It is through learning and interaction that innovation comes. As firms, as individuals, as organizations inter interact with one another, they are able to learn from one another and they are able to develop innovation. Therefore, learning and innovation are strongly interconnected, but not identical. Land also went away to, uh, I had to assume the core evolutionary aspect and he said national systems differ in terms of specialization, both in production and trade and in terms of knowledge base. And that's where we talk of the national systems of innovation. That's where you find that certain systems that may work in Kenya may not be able to work maybe in Nigeria or elsewhere because they differ in specialization, both at production and trade and in terms of their knowledge base. National systems are systematic in the sense that the different elements are interdependent and that interrelationships matter for inter innovation performance. All we are talking about is about interaction and learning. What Nanvel was insisting on is the interactionist process where interaction and learning becomes the key issue when it comes to innovation. You give example of public research institutes and academia industry, which serve as research producers, carrying out research and development activities. On the other hand, we have governments and other central or regional play their role in coordination among the nations. Therefore, we are talking about research and we are talking about interaction. We are talking about learning as the basis for innovation. We will therefore look at the learning economy Landwell in 2016 puts interactive learning and innovation at the core of economic analysis. This was based on assumption that knowledge is the most fundamental resource in modern economy. Every economy needs knowledge and learning is the process which is also important. While we are looking at knowledge as a resource, we are looking at learning as the process. So we have knowledge, we go to learn, and this is very fundamental when it comes to modern economy. 
and it's very fundamental when it comes to innovation. He also assumed that learning is predominantly an interactive and therefore socially embedded process that cannot be understood without considering its institutional and cultural context. Therefore, as we interact with one another and another through a social gathering or through social platforms, we are able to continue to interact with one another and be able to learn. Just as we have been able to learn through this Chris lecture series, through the interaction and learning process, we are getting to develop new ideas that will be able to bring up new research. And as the chair said, we'll be able to work and innovate and think of other ways in which we are able to bring influence and continue to evolve. The innovative capacity of an economic entity is directed of its is directly related to its learning ability. So that you find that any economic entity, whether it's a firm, whether it's an organization, for its innovative capacity to develop, there must be learning. And in this learning, we are talking about the networks. When it comes to networking, we are talking about social interaction. Through the social interaction, through the learning ability, then innovative capacity of any entity is built. And we find that the flow of knowledge, which especially when it comes to tacit knowledge, faces very few impediments when, it, when the system or the social entity is easily accessible when it's partial and concentrated. Therefore, organizations learning theory, this, under, this agrees with the organization learning theory, which says that effective interacting and effective interactive learning processes entail all participants to have similarly structured absorptive capacity. Well, my PhD generally was mainly on interaction and learning. And I was working with the communities in one of the counties in Kenya, and we realized that through interactive learning, the ability to innovate increased. And it was looking also at the quality of the networks. As this community continued to interact and form networks, they were able to learn and innovate more. Thus, you find that Landwald's theory was actually practical on the ground because you find that the learning ability was key and the learning networks were in place and therefore interaction was able to take place. And through that interaction, the community or the farmers were able to develop ideas which were able to bring change and ensure that there was sustainability and sustainable development within the community. Building in the other way also looks at learning, a social system, which is, is looking at a social system, learning being the central activity of innovation. That's when you look at what Goldig found and what Landville found, we find that learning is a social activity that will involve interaction between people. And as the people interact, they are able to innovate. Therefore, central to any innovation is learning. We find that a national system of innovation is also a dynamic system that is characterized by positive feedback and reproduction. Elements of the system reinforce each other, promoting the process of learning and innovation. In the mainstream economics, we find that competition deters agents from sharing knowledge. And we find that many times competition will hinder knowledge sharing and therefore also hinder innovation. But we have competition also on the other hand, people will ma manage to sustain themselves as they innovate so that they'll be able to compete. We learn about the two different modes of innovation, which we are talking about the DUI mode of learning, which is mainly experienced best. And this one we are talking about based on doing, using, and interacting. This comes mainly through experience as individuals do use and interact with one another. We also have the science, technology, and innovation mode of learning, which is science-based. We are talking about our research institutions where we find that there is codified knowledge 
and is based on production and use of codified scientific and te technical knowledge. This type perspective captures processes linking science and technology. We find that both DUI and SDI are necessary for any national system of innovation. Though science has been identified as the key toward technology and innovation, but you find that even tacit knowledge and codified knowledge are both important. To quote some of the studies, we find that an important body of empirical and historical work shows that both modes of learning and innovation play a role in most of the sectors. The role being different depending on the context as well as the strategy that is used. We are talking of the modes of innovation being complementary. None is better than the other. Every system requires all. And one thing that is important is to distinguish them, especially when defining the borders of innovation system. Studies have shown that firms that combine both the DUI and the STI have become more innovative. Therefore, we cannot talk about science being the key, though you find that generally when we look at most of the policies, there is more support for science, technology, and innovation, but there is need for us to think about the DUI mode of knowledge also. How we are able to get this knowledge and be able to capture it so that it's also documented and become codified knowledge that can be able to be used in the future learning. Learning models of innovation emphasize on innovation as an interactive process. As we have talked and we have continued to, to show in this study, interaction is a very key aspect when we come to innovation. And the concept of innovation or national systems of innovation rests on the promise that on the premise that understanding the linkages among the actors involved in an innovation system is key to improving technology performance. So when we are talking about technology performance, when we are talking about technology growth, it is important to be able to understand the actors that are involved in that system and how they interact. And as we interact, we'll be able to know that the innovative performance of that country will depend largely to the extent of how these actors relate to each other as elements of collective system. We are looking at learning as an interactionist process. We find that NSI approach acknowledges that innovation is an interactive process. These interactions are governed by institutions where we are talking about the regulations, we are talking about our culture. And this complex process is characterized by reciprocity and feedback mechanism. So we talk about innovation, having a system of innovation and feedback. And this determines the success of innovation. The key performance of a country is the way these actors relate to each other. Once we are able to understand how they relate to each other as collective elements of this system and how they are able to create and use knowledge, then we'll be able to understand how the technology is also used in the various interactive systems. Innovation is about creating an environment that people can interact and learn. And according to Landval, as he has said in 1985, learning and innovation commonly occur through interaction between holders of different types of knowledge, e.g. the users and producers of technology. And such interactive learning is conditional by institutional and cultural factors related to that nation or state. That's why I find we focus on the national system of innovation. And the foundations are malfaceted the innovation processes is significance in the dynamic relationship between individual and collective systems. So the systems of innovation constitute of activities that are defined by knowledge seeking activity, activities to develop new economic value. And this interaction among agents is what defines the technical and economic opportunities, which when taken, they define the innovation opportunity. So it is very important that farms, nations be able to identify and act upon these technical and economic opportunities in order to innovate as Dossi and I talked about. 
Freeman pioneered the vision that innovation should be an interactive process, not a linear one. We are not talking about linear of research extension pharma, but it's an interactive process that automatically comes out of research and development efforts. And this perspective of innovation as a process of interaction between producers and users may be seen as a micro dimension or a new perspective. Though we find that interaction and knowledge exchange has become key to the national systems of innovation. And now when you look at research and development or STI is coming in to be able to incorporate interactive learning and research into the systems of research, science and technology, which initially were not there. So innovation and technology development are resulting from complex relationship among actors. And currently we are talking about actors interacting together. In every system, we are talking about interaction, whether it is proposal development, whether it is uh, fulfilling a, uh, a certain assignment, policy development, all this time we focus on interaction as a system that can be brought together and individuals can work together to be able to interact. In summary, what we are coming to talk about now, we are just talking about the systems of innovation and how these systems have been able to work together to ensure that we are able to fulfill that which is required in the learning process. In conclusion, I've talked about three aspects about evolutionary economics. The basic argument that innovation is the main factor behind the long run economic development is the same. Whether it is the new or the old evolutionary economies, we are talking about innovation being key to long term economic development. We are looking at the argument that evolutionary process is characterized by strong regulations. The important role of learning is also key to innovation. And there's need that innovation be part and parcel of systems, need for learning, need for interaction, so that we are able to innovate. The study of innovation systems is the study of evolutionary mechanism. We are talking about the theory of innovation system being exploring more agents use of resources and existing knowledge to produce new knowledge and create new economy. Innovation and technical progress results from complex set of relationships among actors producing and distributing and applying kinds of knowledge. And how actors relate in each of these elements as a collective system will determine the performance of that inno innovative performance of that country, innovative performance of that firm. Therefore, it is important that we be able to understand the linkages among actors involved in an innovation system, which is key to improving technology performance. Thank you. I hand over to you, Chair. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Lillian. Uh, also, uh, an excellent presentation, well framed, well in time, and I think it just gives us the chance now to allow the co-chair, uh, Rebecca Hanlon. Uh, are you there, Rebecca? Do you want to put your slide uh, set on? Please take the space. Okay, thanks Lillian. Uh, can everybody hear me? Okay, so uh, I'd like to thank Lillian for her presentation, her lecture. Um, it was uh, very thorough, uh, covered a lot of different points. And so I am not, and, and in order to allow plenty of time for discussion, I'm not going to give uh, a lot of comments. Uh, but I do want to reiterate a couple of key points that, um, that, is this going to work? Yes. Um, that Lillian made. So I particularly want to focus on interactions and, uh, and institutions. I'd like to say something about um, the relationship between national systems of innovation and, and science and technology. And I wanna talk about um, 
NSI, National Systems of Innovation, as a analytical and as a policy tool. And then I'll, I'll finish with, with some uh, very brief comments on, on its usefulness uh, in, in African contexts. So Lillian made mention to both evolutionary economic theory, but also to institutionalist theory and interactionist and interactionist uh, approaches. And those are key. And I think this is what makes um, the work that we do in the Globex community uh, so different um, from, from a lot of other work that goes on um, in, in related areas because we focus on the system making connections uh, within, within the system. So we're not just looking at uh, particular actors within the system, but we're very focused on how those actors interact with each other, the strength of those interactions and the quality of those interactions. And one of the reasons that we do that is because we, um, we focus on a significant, the broader set of literature and disciplinary fields. Uh, the original authors, some of, of this field, some of whom are, are with us today, um, are aware of that um, and, and utilized literature from sociology, from psychology, from political science, from political science. And today we have a number of different disciplines within, within the area. Um, and we need to utilize those disciplines more in order to, uh, to, to make the most of, of this, uh, this concept. The second thing I wanted to um, just reflect on a little more was the preeminence or the, the overarching focus that's often given to science uh, in, in the the term science, technology, and innovation. Uh, Lillian rightly outlined that national systems of innovation is built on the idea that there are multiple forms of knowledge and that, uh, that different types. Unfortunately, in a lot of policy contexts, science with a big S still holds sway as being predominantly the most important type of knowledge when it comes to uh, how to support innovation. Um, but we know that there are in fact uh, a range of different knowledges and the, the context in which many of us live uh, requires uh, the, the, the recognition of these different types of knowledges. Uh, and so when we come to thinking about policy responses to development, uh, to industrialization, uh, we have to think about what knowledges are, are important and how these different types of knowledge impact on the type of firms that are promoted, for example. Firms, as Lillian said, are one of the, the key anchor points of national systems of innovation. But are the, the, the private sector firms, manufacturing firms, uh, the key firms that we need in, in an African environment. Um, and that also relates to the type of knowledge to promote, depending on the development paths that African countries decide, decide to take. And different countries um, are likely to, you know, and, and do uh, focus on, on different types of, of path. So, the third thing I wanted to mention was the difference between um, focusing on NSI as an analytical tool, uh, which is very much the context in which Lillian gave her, her, her lecture, and that of a development tool, that of a tool that is useful for policy discussions. Um, it's a useful tool in visualizing connections, functions and elements for policymakers. And I use it a lot. Um, and I'm just about to show a slide that, that has a, a, a picture of the Kenyan, um, the Kenyan innovation system in it. Uh, but there are limits to that type of approach in the sense that it's reductionist. 
and people often get very hung up on what is in the uh, in the diagram and, and not at the, the broader whole that the diagram is, is trying to represent. Uh, moreover, some countries have explicitly focused on national systems of innovation as an approach to policy. Uh, the most obvious and, and the often cited example is South Africa, which as early as 1996, uh, wrote about and, and championed the idea of a national system of innovation uh, in its white paper on science and technology. Um, even today, uh, UNCTAD launched its technology and innovation report and it makes significant mention to national systems of innovation. The term is highly, um, highly uh, popular, uh, but it, there is very little um, interrogation of, of what it means. Um, often, and it gets uh, reduced to uh, these types of, of diagrams uh, and, and a sense and, and a focus on the, the, the bluey green, uh, the, the boxes, uh, and less on uh, the, the, the lines. And as a result, it's been critiqued for as a, as a concept of being reductive and, and co the complexity with it of, of innovation being, uh, being removed, uh, which isn't actually the case when you read uh, the, the original authors and um, uh, as uh, Lillian has outlined today. Um, so the politics and power of those knowledge flows and, uh, and the learning and, and who has that knowledge and uh, how that knowledge is distributed uh, is is key and we mustn't forget about that and there we have to think more clearly and, and carefully about how we can introduce that uh, back into into policy discussions uh, and the role of political economy is one way of doing it and so uh, some of the work that I'm doing at the moment um, is is focused on trying to uh, reintroduce a, a political economy lens to to thinking about science uh, science funding in in Africa. Um, the second thing is that uh, and that Lillian didn't mention is to recognise that national systems of innovation is only one approach to uh, to systems of innovation thinking, uh, and it is complemented by uh, a number of other focus uh, areas, particularly at the sectoral level and increasingly um, there's a concept of local innovation systems and South Africa in its latest review of its STI policy for example has placed an emphasis on uh, building local systems of, of innovation. So for the what I would like to say in closing is that I think national systems of innovation is part of an arsenal of approaches to analyze the current state of the enabling environment. And that's what it's, that's what it's there for. Uh, and that's what it does best, is that it provides us a way of understanding the enabling environment and a focusing tool for developing future national policies. And I use policies in the plural because it's not just about science, the, the science, technology and innovation policy, but it's also, it allows us to understand what additional policies um, we are important to consider in order to um, ensure a, a fully enabled environment for innovation to take place. And with that, I will, will stop sharing my screen and I will hand back to the chair so that we can get um, a, lot of, a lot of the discussion points that are coming through in the chat uh, discussed. Thank you very much. And thank you, Lillian, again. And thanks very much, Rebecca. Some very interesting perspectives. And also we can see, I mean, the value of working in systems that affords such experience and an opportunity to reflect on it in the way in which you've done. I'm sure it's added value also in terms of what Lillian has presented to us. As we've spoken through this and also the issues that have been raised, uh, colleagues, sometimes we've seen uh, people mention, and this was particularly triggered in one of your last slides, uh, Rebecca, where you say South Africa says, or South Africa did. South Africa is a country, and it's the people within the country 
that often have opinions. These opinions don't necessarily coincide or converge. And it's in that engagement. It is a contestation. It is a battle of ideas. And in many instances, some of what we reflect, especially historically, if we remove the theoreticians from their context itself, from those that wrote theory, and we look at it without it, that's when we draw the synthetic or artificial lines. And we try then to make the very neat, uh, uh, what is it called? Um, those uh, organograms that policymakers and especially politicians tend to love. Uh, I think they, together with multilateral institutions, uh, probably have shares in the companies that generate such software. But in terms of the real hardware, it's engaging with real people about real ideas and taking these ideas forward. So in that way as well, and with due respect, we have amongst us also, as Rajesh has informed me, um, and we really are not just saying that we're standing on the shoulders of giants. There are giants amongst us in this audience itself. And Rajesh has made a very specific plea if we can uh, kindly encourage or ask uh, specifically, we have Carlota Perez, uh, Bentoke Lundvall, Dick Nelson is here, Helena Lastres, Gabriela Duret, uh, a whole range of colleagues. So uh, we really want to encourage people to also contribute to this discussion. Judith, Lachwinder, a lot of you are in this discussion and we are speaking about all of us in terms of the work we are doing and trying to take it forward, drawing specifically from the insights that have been generated from such pioneering efforts. You know, we are grateful because you've opened the doors to us, but we are also faced with considerable danger. And the considerable danger that confronts us up front is the way in which even the language that emerges from evolutionary economics, from systems of innovation, et cetera, get utilized, but not for the purposes or the depth that gets reflected in the way in which they were originated. And that's because we don't often bring that context forward. And for that, we're very grateful to Lillian's presentation, which showed how these ideas emerged in time, engaging with reality. And that's a big bite for everyone, especially when you think of Africa. It's not that we don't know otherwise. <laughs> It's because there are embedded within us institutional and other forms that preclude us achieving progressive advances. And I'm sure that's why I want to ask, please, from Kalota, Bengtoke, Dick, Alex, uh, and all of us, if people can also chip in and uh, reflect on this. Uh, of course, you're also please encouraged to direct questions specifically to Lillian. We've already picked up quite a few questions directed to us, uh, and we'd want to get through to that. But uh, Rajesh, if I'm following your instructions correctly, uh, we're asking for the colleagues to please uh, uh, step forward and uh, maybe put, uh, put some ideas down. I, I see Ben Toke's finger, so please. <laughs> uh, thanks, Lilian, for a very nice uh, presentation. Uh, sometimes uh, when you make these kind of presentation, you, you like to present the old, the old guys like uh, Dick, who is here. Wonderful to see you, Dick. Hello. Mm -hmm. uh, and Freeman, and, and I'm a much younger person, but still, <laughs> uh, for you, I'm also one of the old guys. There's a tendency to present them um, as a kind of team uh, contributing to something like innovation systems. Uh, but we are uh, definitely not the same. Mm. Uh, Dick and me, we are not the same and Chris and me are not the same. So what I would like to do here is just to say a few words, what I think Chris uh, would say uh, to the presentation. Uh, Chris, in a paper from uh, 1995, uh, which was published in Industrial and Corporate Change in uh, 2019, and followed by a series of comments in 2020, 
in industrial and cultural change, including an excellent piece by Dick Nelson. Um, he came with a broad understanding how he sees uh, evolution. Huh? And he actually uh, warned against too narrow uh, perspective in terms of uh, uh, looking uh, only on innovation. And he said the innovation system could be a useful concept, but it's much too narrow. We need to bring in uh, several other. Uh, he talks actually about five or six subsystems, uh, more or less in that uh, presentation. And he would be, um, he in, in another paper from, uh, I think, 92 or something on uh, green innovation paradigm, he also uh, raises uh, some questions about reducing uh, uh, the understanding of science technology to some kind of incremental learning interactive process. And he points out the importance of science as a, a way of breaking up uh, old trajectories and creating new ones. So he says, uh, we always uh, critical to the linear approach, but don't forget that science and heavy investment in science might be a requisite to uh, change and create radical new technologies. I, I think he was, I mean, if you should make a distinction between myself and Chris, I have been much more incrementalist in my uh, work on innovation system. And Chris has been more directly uh, taking ideas from Schumpeter who likes technological revolutions, who likes, uh, and I think in general, uh, also when you talk about these interdependencies, uh, you also need to think that they may become a problem because uh, if we want to tackle, for instance, environmental uh, 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 problems, we need to break up a lot of those relationships and create completely new ones. This is just, uh, 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 I like very much what you said and, uh, uh, and so on, but I just want to add this. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ben Tokia. Um, uh, Lillian, there are questions as well that we'll see on the chat box on the side, but can I ask, I see Carlotta, you've unmuted yourself. So can we ask if you'd please uh, maybe offer some reflections? Well, Yes, I, I was asked to unmute myself. <laughs> I guess that must have been Rajesh. So it's a, it's a challenge because this was a very interesting session and a very controversial one. And I what I feel is that sometimes we forget that there is a distance between what we can do as academics in theory and we can what we can do as policymakers in reality. And I think that bridge has not really been built solidly enough. I feel, first of all, that many of our uh, PhDs and master students in all these innovation schools end up being academics and very often being in countries that don't speak English, write in English because that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's what makes them uh, shine <laughs> or, or go up in, in academic standing or whatever. So we have a very serious problem, which is almost as serious as whether in innovation systems do work in reality or not. I think our theory has got to become more connected with actual policy making to find out, first of all, include the first thing we need to know is if it really works. I mean, are we really describing something which is beautiful, you know, very, uh, rhythmic and, and, you know, we feel good about how, how clear the explanations are. And they do have something to do with reality, quite a bit actually. But when you come down, and I happen to have been a civil servant for quite a few years, when you come down to do the thing, goodness me, 
<laughs> there is politics and there are tensions and there are all sorts of problems that have nothing to do with whether the national system of innovation really works that way. I mean, there are obstacles that cannot be put into the model. And there are ways of overcoming the obstacles that cannot be put, be put into the model. So to criticize the model because it didn't work in reality means that we're only looking at the model and we're not looking at reality. Reality, reality has other complexities. So one thing is to understand and the other thing is to act upon it. And I think one of the things we need to do is to engage with policymakers more. I am extremely worried about what's happening with our sort of Schumpeterian sort of school of thought. Everybody's going for data and doing models and doing things, which is what the others, the, the you know, the, the austerity yeah. people, the, the neoliberals, mm. all those guys, they imposed this business of having to work with data and models and all this. So I find mm. that the people who are supposed to be working with reality, interviewing, where are the people that are doing long-term interviews? We're not interviewing anymore. You know, sometimes mm. I mm. frankly have to tell you that when I look at our journals, mm. I feel bored. I'm mm. sorry mm. for those who Good are trying challenge. to publish in those journals. Mm. They are boring because mm. they are this, you know, this little tiny problem with this little bit of data. And then it goes mm. and, and where's, where are people? Where are the mm. actors? Where are the agents okay. that make a difference? with mm. these things that we have understood. Because the mm. thing is that our theory is the most powerful, but mm -hmm. it is not being used in practice. So my, my almost uh, you know, challenge to all of challenge. us, mm. now mm. that you know, I see there are more than a hundred people listening to mm -hmm. this thing. So I have a mm. wonderful stage to say what I've been wanting to say all the time. <laughs> we need to engage. And this is a moment when the opportunities for development are better than they have been in the past 50 years. This is the first time after mm. import substitution and, mm. uh, and the leap of the four tigers and all that, that we actually have an opportunity because mm. we have the green technology world starting off. And I believe that mm. we're going to have to raise the prices of raw materials and, and in some way it, We've got to do it. I can't discuss this thing now because it's not a space, but we've got to understand that these changes that are going to happen open opportunities that we didn't have before. So more than ever, the innovation scholars have got to connect with politicians. And when I mean politicians, I mean every single person in the whole tree, from the top people, from the, from the political leaders, to the actual policymakers on the ground, and especially with local, local governments, local people, because local people are, you know, they have the opportunity to transform lives now that we have internet. You can have businesses in the furthest corner of the world and it can make money uh, moving it through there if we have, if we just have internet and, and infrastructure for transport, we can think of practically every corner of the territory can become a production place and we don't have to be creating jobs so that we, we can create wealth locally. And to do that, we've got to understand that this idea that production and consumption can be closer now for all sorts of reasons, including the, the need to reduce transport and the need to do, we have many technologies that allow us to do that. So all those things we know about, you know, everybody mm. in this wonderful panel knows mm. that those technologies exist. What are we doing to make them uh, mm. appear in reality, to make them be used, to, to transform the, and sometimes we think we just have to write the strategy of the government. Mm. I think that's useless. I have been mm. in several, well, I remember in my time, this was in the 80s, sorry, it's a long, long time ago, but this is what used to happen. The planning ministry would do the plan, the national plan, and then CONICIT, the Science and Technology Council, okay. would do the Science and Technology Plan. And mm. great uh, <laughs> staples with that. Mm. Never sat together to discuss. 
And today, there is no development strategy that's not an innovation strategy. And that's at every level, national, regional, local, community, mm -hmm. everywhere. We've got to start thinking of actual acting with this understanding that we now have. And every little bit of territory has got to have a strategy, not those big strategy things. We need them too. We need the big plan, but that's not enough. It's never been mm -hmm. enough, but now less than ever. Excellent. Thank you so much, Carlotta. Uh, mm -hmm. Very serious challenge, and I'm sure all of us we are living through this at the moment, so we're really, I think, uh, indebted for you raising the point well, in the way in which you did this. Well. <laughs> we, yeah. have, we have the big challenge. It's like after a war, you exactly. know? Well, it, do you reconstruct I, I, or do you construct anew? That's the yeah. challenge. And austerity creeps behind us, colleagues. So uh, uh, can I ask Dick, uh, Dick, is there something you would like to raise as well? Sorry, sorry? Uh, no, I'm trying to reach across to uh, Dick. Dick Nelson's ah, okay. also there, and he's just unmuted right, here himself. I am in, here I am in California, oh, as a matter of fact. <laughs> yeah, so early, early in the morning. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I think that uh, Lillian's presentation was, was really superb. I, I enjoyed listening to it. Uh, I, it brought back to me uh, many, many fascinating uh, uh, and pleasant uh, memories. I think that uh, uh, the National Innovation Systems concept certainly grew out of a community and the, the community was to a very, very considerable extent uh, generated by Chris uh, and uh, uh, the, the influence of SPRU, the continuing influence of SPRU, uh, the people who taught there, the, the the vast number of students uh, that have come out of there is, is remarkable uh, and holds, I think it continues to hold us, hold us all together. Uh, Carlotta, I, I think your, your, your remarks were smack on uh, a terribly important set of issues. Uh, and uh, I, I would like uh, uh, those, those of us who are here to carry away uh, thoughts of, uh, from, from, from that as uh, we, we, we leave this, this gathering. But I'm gonna go back to some of the intellectual uh, uh, issues. First of all, uh, Lillian, I think that you're quite right uh, in, in stressing that uh, a major part of the orientation here is toward a, a, a learning uh, economy. Uh, that's a term that uh, Ventaka has uh, probably stressed more than, than anyone else. And I think his remark uh, just a few minutes ago about something of a slight difference between uh, his orientation and Chris's uh, regarding uh, Chris's uh, to considerable focus on uh, innovation that, that comes out of, of, of R&D uh, and uh, Vantaka's uh, uh, emphasis on uh, uh, innovation and, and, and changes that, uh, that come out of learning by doing and using is a very interesting and important one. And uh, I, uh, I think they need to be put together and that both kinds of things are going on and interact very, very strongly indeed. And there's an important lesson uh, there or message there uh, for those uh, who are uh, making science and technology policy. And that is the issue of having separate R&D uh, institutions, R&D institutions that are significantly separate uh, and don't have very close connections uh, with uh, the organizations uh, the firms, uh, though they can be hospitals, they can be other types of things, they don't need to be for-profit firms, uh, that in fact are, are doing the work uh, and will have to implement the innovations. If you think about uh, the factors uh, that uh, in the end brought down uh, the Soviet Union uh, and uh, the, the economic system, much less the political system that was behind it, a large part of that problem that they faced in innovation was a sharp separation uh, from the organizations that did the R&D 
uh, from the organizations that had to put the R&D or the innovation in place and their orientation uh, that innovation was the job of the former and just essentially picking up what came out of R&D uh, was the, the function of uh, the firms of the organizations of the hospitals. And I think this is a very major mistake and from uh, what, I, what I understand, uh, a number of the uh, innovation, development through innovation policies that are going on in many countries are viewing that as a function of a separate R&D as driving the, the system uh, to a considerable thing, extent. And I, I think that's, that, that's, a, that's an issue. You can do it in a few areas, but not in, in most of them. That leads me to a second remark. The national innovation system as Chris and Bentaka and I and a few others were developing it back in the 1980s, I think was a very useful uh, way of, of orienting the discussion. But um, as the conversation has uh, proceeded uh, uh, after, after your presentation, Lillian, there's a notion of, of local innovation systems. Then DACA uh, and, and, and I, and I think Chris now certainly would stress that what we have is global systems that uh, are going on. And uh, the, the separation of the national system uh, from the rest of the world uh, was eroding very significantly when the three of us wrote about national innovation systems in the, uh, the, the 19, 1980s, and we recognized it, sort of. Uh, but I think there's some real questions about how you think about national innovation systems now. I don't think you can think about them at all uh, without uh, having as an essential aspect of them, how they link into the rest of the world. Uh, both the private parts of it and the, uh, the, 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 the public uh, parts of it. My third remark would be that uh, if I have one suggestion for you, Lillian, is that uh, uh, you recognize more explicitly the enormous differences across economic sectors and activities uh, in terms of uh, the structures and the mechanisms by which relevant innovation occurs. Agriculture is dramatically different than pharmaceuticals. What goes on in uh, electronics is different from, from either of them. And single structures or single policies don't apply across the board. And in particular, my last point I would like to make is I still th I think that uh, all of us who are involved in Globalix and who are involved in the innovation systems and are involved in that uh, uh, analysis are still much too much stuck on manufacturing. Uh, manufacturing was declining uh, as a fraction of the, uh, the, the total workforce and total production going on in a, in, in a country. Uh, at the time that uh, that Doc and Chris and I and others are writing on it, Schumpeter is almost totally about manufacturing. He doesn't see anything else. Uh, right now, we have to a very, very large extent service uh, economies, where the whole organization of production and the nature of innovation and its occurring uh, is different than it is in in manufacturing. And I think there's been very little. Uh, recognition uh, or movement within the community, uh, our community is concerned with innovation uh, and moving over to try to understand what is happening outside of, of manufacturing uh, in the vast variety of services that uh, are different one from another uh, that uh, are, are dominant in today's economies. That's it. Thanks very much, Dick. Uh, uh, worthy reflections as well. And um, I, I want to uh, very quickly go back to Lillian and also Rebecca. Uh, as you see, there's lots of questions also arising on the side, but I thought maybe as we're receiving some of these comments for some initial responses, uh, are you comfortable to do that, Lillian? Uh, you know, the famous 21st century you are muted. 
<laughs> Please unmute. <laughs> 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 All this requires change. <laughs> the way one speaker has talked about if there is any opportunity for innovation, then it is now. Number that asked about what we can do now during the SDG, how we can connect. If you're talking about innovation being the core to sustainable development at such a time as this, as we interact with one another, we are able to come together and understand. We're talking about understanding the local situation, be able to work to sort out the issue, whether it's in the farm, whether it's the organization from the local perspective and be able to work on it. And when we are talking about sustainable development, we are looking at what will be able to last or what will be sustainable during that moment. And currently we are talking of the national system of innovations we have talked about systems of innovation. Uh, Nelson has just talked about how the innovation in different sectors will come differently. So we are focusing on the national system of innovation. We are talking about the sectoral innovation. And as we work at this, we are relating it to the global systems of innovation and how we'll work together to ensure that there is sustainable development. Maybe that. Any other? Prof, anything you'd like me to comment on? Yeah, I think that's good enough for now, Lillian. There's a, there's a lot more comments building up, and I really worry whether we'll be able to close the session uh, in the next uh, well, 15 minutes. So uh, there is a, um, a, a, um, a contribution from our good friend Gabriela, uh, maybe just south of where Dick was speaking to us from. <laughs> I hope you get the pun. Please, Gabby. Okay, thanks. It, it was very interesting, the session, actually all the, sem the seminar, all the webinars that have been organized because if there is a space to, to interact and talk about the, the new ideas or what we have reflected over all period. I wanted just mm -hmm. to, to, to talk a little bit on some point that I put already in the chat and it's coming back to what Lumbal said some minutes mm -hmm. ago in relation to that uh, working paper of uh, Chris in 1995 that was published in, in, in Industrial and Corporate Exchange in 2019. And then we have here Nelson who wrote some notes of the recent history. And then in that, in that paper, it is really interesting because Chris uh, explained, uh, using the case of India, how the the evolution, the, the economic growth or development is a result not only of science and technology. We need to understand different subsystems, and Rassigan was mentioned uh, that at the beginning. No? The, 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 there is a lot of, a set of different subsystems, not only science and technology, but also economy, culture, uh, politics, etc. that they, they are important to understand the interconnection between all these subsystems, uh, contribute to understand where we are now. And then also coming back to what Carlota said, we have to look at all this in order to think what are the policies that are required in that case, based on, on Chris' uh, contribution, what are the policies that contribute uh, to the evolution of this subsystem, but also to the interactions of this subsystem in order to have co-evolution of this subsystem for development. And we see this uh, approach, obviously national system of innovation is a still a very important concept to understand uh, where we are, but we cannot reduce just to science, technology, and innovation, but we have to understand their connection with uh, politics, uh, cultures, uh, institutions, etc. So, thanks uh, for the space. Thank you much, Gabriela. Um, so, uh, colleagues, I also note there were questions that were posed on the uh, on the chat on the side, and uh, some colleagues that asked very direct. Uh, Veronica, I see uh, you've also been responding to some of the questions while posing questions <laughs> as well. Uh, and there's an important point, I think, uh, maybe if I could just sequel to you. When we speak about data, and you've made the point as well, 
in terms of what gets modeled and how it gets modeled is also important. And it's not just following neoclassical equilibrium styled uh, uh, presumptions of the future. So Veronica, can I ask if you want to make that point and then we could look at other colleagues as well? You'd need to unmute there. Excellent. Hey. <laughs> No, thank you very much for for uh, allowing me to, to to make my point here. Um, no, I I just was uh, trying to think about uh, Carlota says uh, on uh, especially on the necessity of plan because uh, in the, the idea the, uh, of a plan by itself, one plan, two plans, several plans, big plans, small plans, every plan is just go against uh, the idea of intervention uh, in the face of uh, failure. I, I meant any failures, market failures, but also system failures. Because if, if, we, are, if, we, if we start uh, uh, to think uh, intervention when the system fails, uh, there is a, a kind of idea that the, the, probably there is a, a system uh, that not fail, and probably every system fails any time. And we should uh, try to to make policy uh, in in order to to drive to 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 make a direction of this system uh, any time, and not just when it is failing. And uh, the other thing that I I, I want to say is about uh, econometric and especially on uh, experimental econometrics, which is the main way that today uh, uh, economics is uh, trying to, to assess the impact of policies. And I think the, the idea that we can measure the impact of a policy by an experiment trying to, to <laughs> cut any detail of the problem and isolate it uh, is, uh, is just against our idea of systemic thinking. So we, we, we should uh, spend uh, a point uh, around this issue. Excellent. Thanks so much, Veronica. Um, there's also uh, one of our colleagues, I think, um, uh, Wahid, are, are you with us? Um, Walid Salim? Yes. Uh, please. Uh -huh. Um, thank you so much, Lillian and Rebecca, for the presentation and for the um, interesting commentary. Um, I, I was wondering if you could shed some light on um, open networks of innovation. Um, have you come across uh, open networks of innovation in your research in Africa as part of the National Innovation System uh, research? And if you have, um, what, what the role uh, they play within the National Innovation System in, in, African, in African countries and how successful have they been um, um, uh, as, a, as one of the elements within the, within the system? and um, what impact they had uh, in, in, in impeding or facilitating the flow of knowledge within the national system of innovation in African countries. If, if, if you come across this in your research and you could, sh could share some of your insights, I would really appreciate it. Excellent, thanks so much, uh, Walid. Uh, uh, colleagues Lillian and Rebecca, if you don't mind, can I take a few more comments from colleagues that are asking on the side? and then we can come around for uh, people to respond. So please uh, keep that uh, open innovation challenge to the national or the closed systems uh, view that sometimes we work on. And um, can I move across to uh, a colleague from South Africa? You see the bias attached to this, but <laughs> it's a young person, uh, Rindani, who has uh, a, a serious question to ask about whether all of this is actually useful to us in terms of the challenges that we are currently confronted by. Rindani? Hi, thank you uh, very much, uh, Rasigan. I didn't expect that you'll ask me to directly uh, <laughs> pose, my, uh, pose my question. Um, but I think the, the key uh, element uh, that I wanted to uh, to reflect on. I'm just going up a little bit because I made the comment uh, uh, quite earlier on. Was there was a lot of emphasis on the uh, 
uh, aspect of interactions. And I'm wondering now if uh, a part of the policy must be mandating uh, interactions uh, through different mechanisms that government can look at, uh, be it from a budgetary perspective uh, that the state might have, uh, especially around uh, uh, the state actors. Because really, if you look at the reviews of, of, the, of the South African system of innovation um, and other academic outputs, uh, it's quite clear that our system is fragmented. Uh, it's quite clear that our system is uncoordinated, but there isn't a way forward in terms of what must happen. And if the heart of the system of innovation is indeed interactions, uh, I'm wondering if is it not time where government could you know, elevate some of its perspectives and mandate some of these interactions and see if we are able to force uh, a part of that learning that we want to have at a, at a later stage. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much, Rendani. And that's also quite a challenging question being raised in the form in which uh, Rendani has raised it. And it does speak to the experiences that we've drawn. We've used the frameworks that uh, the colleagues have mentioned that Lillian has presented to help inform the way in which we conduct our research. But the extent to which the outcomes of our research, how we present it and how we use it to engage with policy making, to pick up on what Carlota said, not the person, but the process itself, may require further attention from us. You know, things that are not working, at some point we have to realize we need to find solutions beyond them. And I think the perspective about learning and its relationship to innovation still requires much more acceptance, even on our continent, let alone across the global south. So using that uh, passage of a few words from my side to having given our colleagues, Rebecca and Lillian, a chance also to think through those, we're at the point where I'm not so sure we could take on more questions. So if it's all right, can I start with you, Rebecca, and then move to Lillian to, to help uh, bring us all together again? Yeah. Is that all right, Rebecca? The two yeah, no. Um, uh, thank you all for, for all the comments. And it's great to have such a dynamic dynamic discussion on this. Um, and I hope we can we can continue the discussions um, it, into the into the future in, in different ways. Um, I want to make, uh, I think, just two points. One around bridging uh, academic and uh, and policy makers. I think this is crucial. I mean, I've been working now with the uh, science councils in Africa for the last four, four and a bit years, um, more or less full time. And it, the, the we, we have a, a significant issue in trying to um, to work with them and and help them understand the, the uh, a set of broader issues because as Carlotta said they 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 work within systems that themselves are uh, very um, uh, very focused on on key issues and and are limited uh, in in terms of what they can do. Um, we're, we're going to be spending a significant amount of time actually working with them in understanding policy processes. And um, uh, Bettina Diamet isn't here today, but she, uh, she had a very interesting conversation with, with some of them a, a couple of years ago at a workshop. And she came away from it and she said to me, I never understood that they didn't know how, to, how policy making took place. Uh, with uh, with these particular policymakers that we were working with, she said, I, I kind of understood that they they understood the theory of policy making, but many of them, you know, had had never received this uh, any knowledge about it. They they go into to the system and they work within the yeah. system. Yes. Um, so uh, yes, interesting discussion. Thank you. Um, so I think there's a lot more we can do about this, and and we ha we have a plan to uh, bring in uh, a number of uh, a number of you who are on the call um, in into a new project that will try and link uh, African uh, innovation scholars with 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 these policymakers into the future. So look out for more on that. Um, 
the question around uh, should policies man uh, mandate interactions, um, I think you also asked a question around, which is linked to that, around the role of capabilities building and how capabilities can, um, can how learning capabilities can be promoted. And I think that's, that's the key part here is, is uh, and it goes back to this, uh, issue around linkages between policymakers as well. So uh, linking up and, and getting people to speak across uh, ministries is is key here. Um, as much as it is around, you know, the, the degree of, of, of state um, state regulation um, and uh, in in uh, in in terms of, of, of interaction. So it's it's facilitatory policy um, that's required here. And it, it's about uh, making uh, ministries talk across each other. And so another thing that we, we will be doing in this project is uh, analyzing not just STI policies, but a broader set of policies, as I, as I mentioned earlier. Um, the last thing I wanted to just say is I completely, um, I understand the, the complexity of the science, technology and innovation uh, mix. And uh, uh, Bal, I didn't want to, I wasn't uh, trying to suggest that um, the, 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 the linear model is, uh, um, I, think, I, I think the issue we, we have is that the policy often, um, focuses too much on science and increasingly actually on technology. And I, I still haven't got my head around the, the relative merits of, of a focus on, particularly in with, within the context of the four, fourth industrial revolution, the, the relative merits of, of technology um, and, and science-driven technology um, in, in environments where we have, as, as Dick mentioned, significant levels of service industries uh, poor infrastructure that Carlotta mentioned, uh, bureaucrac bureaucratic universities that um, and, and regulatory environments that that stifle innovation, um, and that leads to the question on open systems of innovation. I it's not something that I have studied in depth. It is becoming an increasingly um, an increasing area of interest. Open innovation, open data, open science. Um, but the degree to which people are paying lip service to it and the degree to which it's, it's gonna become a, a significant area of discussion is, is still, still something that I think we're, we've yet to see. Let me stop there. Excellent, thanks so much, Rebecca. Uh, Lillian? Uh, Lillian? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> just to pick up from where Avek had stopped the section on open innovation, generally as he says, it's, it's something that many people are now talking about, though its practicality has not been seen, maybe it varies depending on the different sector, as one of the speakers had explained, you know, innovation in each sector will be different. What is happening in agriculture will be different from manufacture and all that. So you find it has been there, but I've not looked at it in detail, but it is there. Though you can find it in specs and sports in different sectors, suddenly maybe you can talk about in agriculture where you find the research is integrating the other stakeholders to be able to help them bring the inflows and outflows of knowledge. And this mainly mm -hmm. will support, especially when it comes to the infrastructure, where there is infrastructure limiting, funding and all that, though much I can't say much has been done or need as, as what I know, but I think it's a process that is in progress. And it would be very helpful for national systems of innovation once we have to integrate it. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, so good colleagues, uh, as I was briefed earlier, and I know there's a whole flurry of people that would like to be raising comments and that's really a positive statement to the Chris collective that's organizing these events. You know, there's a big dynamic that you need to pick up on, but also we don't really have all the time available to us to cover uh, everyone in the scope of what we uh, are doing here. Yeah? A, a point raised towards the end of what Rebecca has mentioned and Lillian has also now highlighted upon this. 
And Carlotta did point this out. Dix mentioned it with respect to the changes taking place, labor process-wise, what's taking place in actual production itself. I think the emphasis that I had started upon, I would like colleagues, all of you, we've worked together a long time, but please to remember this. We need to be critical about what's taking place around us and relate our theoretical frameworks to that critique, colleagues. Clapping hands for the advantages of fourth industrial, fifth industrial, sixth industrial revolutions, when we cannot guarantee the flow of electricity or for that matter, uh, the provision of healthcare are immediate concerns and they speak to a denuded capability at the level of production. Maybe we need to turn the name away from manufacturing, but industrial capabilities still remain critical. We don't have them on the continent. So a lot more engagement, these differences between North and South, and especially the learning activities, as Rebecca has mentioned, I do hope these now start offering us the opportunity to learn from each other. Part of this interactivity also implies a level of trust between us. And this is something I really want us to encourage. We can be very critical about the work we are doing. If we trust each other, we will listen to each other and learn from the critique, not just throw and bandy about, not just rhetoric, but frame things ideologically that don't allow us to advance. So when we use national systems in a narrow framework, Ben Toke, it's not just a policy document. It goes with xenophobia and us closing the doors on working with our neighbors. These systems are not as hardwired. We don't have such a long evolutionary history. Berlin decided the marks between us. Yeah. The fact that South Africa can be resistant or resilient to COVID-19, when we have enclaves within us that are national systems themselves, doesn't allow us. You know, one of the uh, ministers in a cabinet in Iswatini did get COVID-19. Iswatini does not have a national health system. That person was treated in South Africa, but we stop ordinary people from crossing the border. So we've got lots to learn and lots to reintegrate. And I think using the tools ceded to us through Ben Toke's pioneering work, Dick Nelson, Carlotta, Helena, Gabriela, the whole crew, the Git is also on it. We need to draw these in, make it work for us. We can make innovation work using these systems to help us. So Rajesh, from your instruction, and I'm very careful not to step out of line, uh, uh, I, I'm uh, being told I need to uh, hand over to Swati, if I'm correct, Rajesh. Thank you. Thanks, Swati. Thanks, uh, you, Thanks so very much, Rasigan. You are absolutely right that we need to learn more and uh, more and more and uh, need to understand uh, the complexities of underlying mechanism of learning, which is too complex and uh, too difficult to comprehend from the data, which we have, as, as Carlotto uh, Perez have actually uh, talked in her uh, very insightful remarks. And uh, I'm so thankful for everyone for this active participation and uh, many thanks and congratulations to Lillian for her excellent presentation. We are thankful uh, to the chairs, Professor Resigan and Professor Rebecca. And, uh, uh, and it was so, so pleasant and so delightful to have such an interesting discussion, which raised many questions for, for further deliberations, which we are going to take further in our upcoming lecture series, which we are going to have next week, next Friday, that is uh, 12th of Feb at 2 p.m. GMT, the topic of the uh, presentation then would be the institutional aspect of national system of innovation uh, to be presented by Dr. Olga and uh, Dr. Manuel and would be chaired by Professor KJ Joseph, Director, Golati Institute of Finance and Taxation. He's also uh, the, uh, President Bello Billings. And uh, see you all next week. And uh, this, it was a pleasure to have a very nice talk uh, this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Bye. Swati, can you bring down the presentation? Can you bring down the screen sharing? And please, <coughs> all, all of you, please unmute and say hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi. 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 <laughs> Just reminding people, those books are still there, and uh, we're still using them. <laughs> Great lecture, Lillian. Great sharing, Rasigan and Rebecca. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, everybody, for joining. It's great to Thank see you. everybody. Okay. Bye. Bye. Nice to see so many nice people. Yeah. I'm a ghastly. Get well soon, Ben Tokay. Okay. Okay. People are possible with a perfect system. See everything more well organized. Uh, thank you, Rajesh, and uh, it was. was good. Thank you very much. You, the the uh, moderation was excellent. I forgot to mention. <laughs> Congratulations, that was excellent. You did an excellent job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye. Okay. Thanks, Alex, for coming. Alex. Hey. Hi Alex, Hi, how are you? I'm fine. Are you? <laughs> fine. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Nice to see you too. Caleb, how are you, Caleb? Caleb, please unmute. Yeah. How are you? Very nice. Congrats. Thank you very much. Thank Keep you. Keep the good job. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for joining. Great. Yeah. So, so thank you very much. Can I end the session now?